Be Lessons from the Book, The Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy. Dan Kennedy is one of the founding fathers of direct response marketing. He coined the phrase, the lead magnet. Indirectly, he's the person responsible for Alex Ermosi's marketing approach and the founder of ClickFunnels. I'm going to start with a quotation here. The creation of sales letter sequences, rather than just creating sales letters, is as responsible as any other single idea for my becoming a millionaire while still young enough to enjoy it and for making millions of millions of dollars for my personal clients. So what Dan Kennedy is saying is that if you send more than one letter, so maybe three letters, you're, you're possibly going to double your responses just by doing that. So this is the mindset in direct response marketing around things like retargeting or sending lots of emails. And it also applies when you're sending letters. An example of this is Apple. Apple for the past few months has been bombarding me with emails to sign up for their credit card and I've still never done it, but eventually I might actually decide to say yes. And that's something Dan Kennedy points out is that people that initially say no may say yes later, if you hit them at the right time. And it's not that you can predict when that right time is. It's just that by increasing the frequency, you're more likely to hit them at a point where they will respond. And where he borrowed this idea is from collections agencies. Collection agencies are constantly calling, sending letters, warning you that you need to pay. And by simply increasing the frequency, they're able to get people to pay. It works. It's effective. And that's the reason they do it. They don't just send it once. And if you say no or refuse, they give up. They keep pounding. Now, the success with sales letter is largely to do with thinking like a salesperson. And uh, my own opinion here is you need to think a little less like a marketer. Now, when you're doing brand marketing, you need to think like a marketer. What's creative? What's going to get attention? But when you're trying to sell something through a letter, that means a different approach. That means you have to address objections. You have to give lots of details. You have to settle every little concern that the buyer is going to have. And selling very different from promoting a brand. Another key thing is that you need to avoid perfectionism. Now, I was listening to the CEO of this company before, and he was saying, a lot of his clients are successful because they're not perfectionists. So instead of trying to be a trying to be a perfectionist, what you really need to do is just try to understand the customer. By understanding the customer, by empathizing, you're going to be able to create a sales letter that's effective even if it's not perfect. At least it aligns with what they want as the buyer. So, how do you understand the buyer so that you can sell to them? There are some key things to consider. What keeps them awake at night? Is it acid reflux, for example, or uh, something a little more metaphorical, like the stress of their marriage? Uh, two, what are their fears? Three, what makes them angry? Four, what are their frustrations? What are the trends in their lives or business? So for example, AI, is that disrupting them? What are their desires? What is their bias in making decisions? So for example, for me, I often like to go with the best. I want Bang & Olufsen because that's the highest luxury audio equipment there is. I also like to buy Passati, Made in Italy Umbrella. I like the best. Some people, they really just want the, the best uh, value for money or they just want the cheapest, or they want something that arouses them emotionally, or something that's uh, perhaps analytically the best decision, relying on social proof or analysis. Number eight, do they use some sort of special language? So gamers, for example, have certain lingo that they, they employ, and can you include that in your sales letter? Number nine, um, are there other competitors that are successfully selling to them that you can replicate? And 10, are there competitors that are failing to sell to them? And if so, why? So to really understand the customer, what you can also do is attend their meetings, read their, train, their trade journals, find out their priorities, and address those instead of your priorities. The worst sales letter is one where you're talking about what you want, what you're trying to pitch, what you're trying to sell. Instead of showing that you understand what they want, what they're trying to achieve. A pretty representative example of this would be if you're trying to sell the dentist. So a lot of successful web designers, contractors, lawyers, et cetera, are, are going to work with dentists. And so what you want to do, if that's your niche, is sign up for forums for dentists. 
not for your competitors, not for other people in your industry, but for your target customers. And then you can start to understand what they're having conversations about, what their pain points are, what they are really concerned with, what's top of mind. Join their email groups, go to their trade shows, their seminars. You'll get a better understanding of who they are, what they want. What you want to do is center the conversation around what is already happening in the buyer's mind. And I think this is something a lot of marketers get wrong is that they think they think their job is to create demand. And yeah, you can create demand, but it's very expensive. It's very time consuming and it's actually very unprofitable in most cases to create demand. What's much easier, what's like going downhill instead of uphill is simply satisfying demand that's already there. And that's why you need to get in the buyer's mind. What, what are they looking to buy? What problem are they looking to solve? And go with that, ride that wave. Don't interrupt, go with the flow. Another key thing, look for the hidden benefit. So for example, in the book, they talk about people that are attending a seminar. But really the thing they're most excited about, the thing that they're talking about the most is not the seminar, it's going to play golf afterwards. So what they did in this case is they created the promotion where they highlighted the golf in the headline because that is what is going to get their attention. That's what that's the hidden benefit of attending the seminar. And uh, you can find that in your situation too. So for example, you're selling a business to business product that increases the, the profits of the business, but maybe the hidden benefit is the person's going to get the director or their boss off their back. Or this is a conservative choice where you're not going to get blamed if anything goes wrong. That could be a hidden benefit in B2B. Another key little tactic here is admit what's wrong with your product and address flaws openly. Because one of the biggest resistances you're going to have to people buying your product is they just don't believe it. They believe it's too good to be true. So if you say what's wrong, like, okay, our price is super low, like drop.com, for example really great deals on products. The catch, the thing that makes it believable is you have to wait a long time to get it. The delivery is slow. So then it's like, oh, okay, now I understand why it's cheap. There's a trade-off here. It makes sense. Okay, I trust it now. Uh, another example here is, so I bought these books, these boots for around $700, these made in England boot, boots. And then I went to this website the next day or a few days later, and I see them for only 76 pounds. So one, about one seventh of the price. And I'm like, no, the, my scam alert's going off, right? Because it is actually a scam. That's just too good to be true. Now, uh, maybe this if this wasn't a scam, they would have to explain why it isn't, why it is a believable situation. So for example, maybe they're going out of business and they need to get rid of stock. Or maybe this is a special promotion where only the first 10 people get it at this price. And uh, what they're really trying to do is get you signed up for an email list, something like that, to make it believable. So talk about the flaws and address them and explain them. Another tactical approach with marketing psychology is fear of missing out, FOMO. So an example of this in copywriting is find out how these furniture shop owners have discovered success. So often the most effective marketing is not when you're not always when you're looking for people at the top, but you're looking at people that are at the same level as the buyer because people trust people like themselves. So if all these other furniture shop owners are successful and increasing their profits and whatnot, well, I'm missing out. What, what, what am I missing? And that the thing that they're, they're missing is whatever it is that you sell, or maybe it's just some information you're giving away is the first stage in your marketing, your direct marketing funnel. Now, one thing you really need to do is get attention because if you don't get attention, people are just going to throw your letter out. And if you don't get attention, they're just going to scroll through your app. So you need to get that attention and then drag them. That's, that's the visual you need to think of. You're dragging them through the rest of the letter so they read it. It's not, you're not just expecting them to do it. You need to pull them through with things like ellipses, short paragraphs, et cetera. So to do that, you have to convey to them that you have something to say of urgent importance. So it's urgent to them. It's gonna solve their biggest problem, if that's the case, or perhaps a small problem that you need to exaggerate and say why it is a big problem. And uh, it's a benefit to them. And it has to be, a, you generally want to focus on something that is, uh, of genuine benefit to them. It's genuinely uh, important. Another key tactic to, to get attention is to use a grabber. So for example, you send this letter and then you include a coin with it or you include a tea bag 
or you include a foreign currency. Now, a little word of caution here. I did this before with an actual silver coin uh, and it got stolen. So somebody in the mail system just took it out. Uh, fortunately, they did reseal it and send the letter, but the, the silver coin got lost. So uh, if, you're, if it's too valuable and you're worried about that, then make sure you're going with uh, some sort of registered mail or insured type mail. Another thing you can do is you can go to this website, 3D Mail Results. They'll give you some cool little gimmicks like a message in a bottle. So yeah, these are gimmicks, uh, but gimmicks work in this case. Another key thing is to use prestige appeals. So things like charter member, exclusive, select, superior. Company that I think does as well is LinkedIn. LinkedIn is always giving me these notification that says, you're one of a few experts invited to add to this collaborative article. So it makes it feel like I'm, I'm special. I'm, this is exclusive to people like me or me. Something to understand in marketing with regard to human psychology is people are fundamentally lazy. So what you want to do is you want to prove that your product is easy to use. And you do that by using your copy, you use it by using photographs, and you also use testimonials. Just explain how easy it is, easy to set up, easy to fix if something goes wrong. We're going to do handhold you through the whole sign up process and the registration and the tutorials. Anything that's complicated is often just dismissed and thrown away. All right, now some specific tips if you're marketing a professional service. Include the number of years in business. Now, uh, when I was doing professional service marketing earlier in my career, I, I thought this was kind of silly, right? Number of years of business, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, yeah, buyers often don't care about that stuff. What they really want to know is, do you specialize in solving problems that they have? But when we're dealing with direct response marketing, often the more you tell, the more you sell. So the more facts, figures, lists, persuasive arguments you can uh, make, you're going to build this giant case of why people should go with you and you're going to help overcome any sort of hesitation. So for example, if I, if I go to somebody and I say, uh, I'm, I'm the number one LinkedIn advertising consultant uh, in North America, um, okay, that's compelling if I'm looking to hire a LinkedIn expert, but my concern is going to be, well, uh, when did you start specializing in this? Did you just decide I'm going to start this business yesterday? Well, uh, you overcome that by saying, oh, I've been in, year in business for 12 years. I have a thousand clients served. Here's a list of some of my clients. Here are my proprietary methods. I have a special way to solve problems. Here's some testimonials. Here's before and after photos. Here's some case studies. Oh, and by the way, I offer a free consultation or here's my free package of information. So what you're doing with this offer is you're overcoming that initial skepticism and mistrust, which is one of the biggest barriers in sales letters. Another key tactic is to create sales letters that look like articles and they often outperform kind of your standard salesy type letter. So an example here, we're promoting socialworker.sg in Singapore. And this really just looks like an article about a good Samaritan who's paying it forward. Um, this kind of overcomes that, oh, this is an ad, I, I can ignore it. No, it's an interesting article. It's a personal story, which is what journalists often like to focus on, storytelling. Another key tactic with the copywriting is you want to flag down your audience. So some examples of copy, waiters and waitresses on your feet for hours. And then you continue with what you have to say. Disappointed dieters, guaranteed weight loss. Annuity agents, how to. Seniors, 28 days to. So you can identify who the target customer is by naming what they are, or you can just target by people based on what the problem is that they have. So for example, foot pain, embarrassing belly bulge, no one to sell to, blood in your toothbrush. Uh, I think often it's safer to go with the problem because segmenting based on who they are doesn't always make sense and statistically doesn't always align the way you would expect it to, but segmenting based on problem, based on value proposition can be extremely effective. Now, you're selling something through direct mail, through sales letters, through direct response. Your price is probably a little bit high. So let's say at least $50. You're not selling a $1 ball pen. So sometimes what you have to do is you have to minimize the price, particularly if you're selling something $1,000 or more. And I, I don't mean literally lowering the price. I just mean making it seem smaller. And you do that by showing other things that seem bigger. So for example, these books weigh 13 pounds and cost nearly $20 just to ship. 
here's a thousand and one pieces of information to show why this is valuable. So if there are a thousand reasons to buy this product and it's only a hundred dollars, then okay, that's a good deal uh, juxtaposed to the, the number of benefits that are with it. So list every vitamin, list every health benefit. Uh, you could say something like it's good for 10,000 repetitions without needing maintenance. If you're selling something like a, a B2B industrial tool, um, another thing is to talk about how the product was made. So months of laboratory tests that cost over $1 million. Uh, but you can get this product now for only $1,000. Uh, you can also break the price into monthly payments. So pay only $14.95 per month, and maybe it's a 12-month program. Um, you could also say, for example, let's say you're selling consulting services. You could say, it's like having a $300,000 marketing executive by your side for only $10,000 per month. Key formula for copywriting that's effective, the classic is problem, agitate, solve. So you mentioned the problem, you agitate it by saying, here's what's gonna happen if you don't solve it, or uh, you just go into more detail about how painful that problem is, and then you present the solution, which could be your offer or your product. Uh, here's an example of that. Yes, that delivery man was paying for his half million dollar home with money from the goods he had stolen from my client's supermarket. So we're appealing to supermarket owners. We're mentioning just how we're elaborating on how aggravating it would be if a delivery man stole from you and how he's having this great life because he, he's making money off of you. Now, the key to unlimited media attention, according to this Dan Kennedy book, is to predict and provoke, essentially to position yourself as a fortune teller. A lot of people that are great at personal branding are basically willing to make predictions, go on the news, go into articles, and stand by those predictions. And to be honest, a lot of people are never going to go back and fact check. It's really just about what's now. What, what do people care about now? AI is going to completely change economics or uh, the economy is going to go down, etc. Doug Casey's new investment predictions for 1987, available to you now in this free report, that sort of thing. All right, some key ways to drive action, because that's really what we want with direct response. That's really what we want when we want to sell something. Talk about limited availability. Thousands have joined in the last 30 days. So you're using a bandwagon, social proof effect. Only some can qualify. Many reported net gains of $10,000 to $25,000. So we're talking here about ROI and that can get people to make action. Guaranteed to save you X amount of dollars. You can also use big, bold, strong guarantees to overcome the resistance to taking action. So for example, if for any reason you are not fully satisfied with your purchase, return it for a full refund. So really elaborate on those guarantees. Use redundancy. Receive a full 100% refund of every penny you pay. We're just repeating the same thing in, in various different ways, but we're building confidence. So there's no confusion at all as to what uh, that refund or that guarantee is. And uh, another key is you might want to consider making the guarantee the primary focus of the offer. It could be in the headline, for example. I think a common mistake content marketers do is they try to create content that's going to get as much readership as possible, but you're not really looking for a lot of people when you're doing sales letters, what you're looking for is to appeal to the people that will actually buy. So write for the buyer, not the non-buyer. And often what that means is providing a lot of information. Somebody that's not going to buy is really just interested in, oh, that's a cool story, an interesting fact or some useful information. But a buyer really wants to know, is this compatible with Mac? Is this compatible with PC? Does it integrate with X? Does it Will it fit my speaker? So for example, I went into Berluti, this upscale leather store, and I was looking for a bag to fit my, my speaker into. And so I was asking the measurements. I really needed to know those details. Somebody who's not a buyer doesn't care about the details. They just want to look at something and get some sort of minimal thing out of it. Now, Dan Kennedy says that there are basically two types of personas you need to appeal to, the impulsive person and the analytical person. Uh, to appeal to the impulsive person, you really need to make your text uh, skimmable. Uh, so using short paragraphs, little call out boxes, things like that. The analytical person might want to see charts, lots of details, uh, lots of compatibility features, things like that. So how do we sort of break things up and make them easy to digest? Bold headlines, bold subheadlines, photos with captions. People always, almost always read captions, boxes, circles, highlights, short paragraphs, etc. 
Now, there are six ways that you can convey your sales message and the redundancy is fine. Let's, let's communicate the main point in six different ways if we can. So in a straightforward statement, using an example, using a story, using a testimonial, using a quote, and using a numbered summary. Okay, you wanna use short sentences and short paragraphs. Top companies do this all the time. You take a look, for example, at Shopify Plus website, very short paragraphs. The mistake I've made in my copywriting before is uh, making paragraphs that are well over three to four sentences. I, I believe I, I used to double that. Uh, you wanna be entertaining, but not funny. So you wanna be energizing. You wanna keep people moving. Don't, don't be a flat academic. So let's go through the copy of this sales letter. Dear Briarwood area homeowner, you've probably lived in your home for three, four, maybe even five years. And in that time, a lot of traffic has taken its toll on your carpets. You notice this sort of conversational one-on-one -on -one tone of this letter. It's not very academic, not a, a lot of heavy vernacular, not super professional, and it doesn't even need to be grammatically correct. And now we're going into this bold center text. We guarantee to make your your uh, competing look like new or there's no charge for our services. Here's how it works. We'll come to your home by appointment. First, we'll test the worst spot. If you job, judge that job successful, blah, 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 like new again, no matter what. What you want to do a lot of times is create a vivid mental, mental picture. Now, cash advertising is an interesting copywriting book where they talk about how the first time somebody experiences your product is in their mind. It's where they're sensually visualizing it in a creative way. So using copy can be effective here. For example, why you should put on a ski mask, lower yourself from the ceiling on a wire like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible to steal Bill's blueprint. Great copywriting. Key thing is you want to address objections. People are going to have a million objections when you try to sell them something. Address those just like a good salesperson would. And there's basically a few different ways you can do that. A direct answer to their objection, a testimonial or case study to respond to it, or a guarantee slash offer that addresses it. Good example of this, this person, this company recently reached out to me, they want me to be a speaker for their event. And they're saying, okay, uh, you get to share your insights to a large audience, promote your offerings, earn affiliate commission, and uh, the one that really stood out to me here is you don't need to appear live. So that's one of my biggest resistances to being a speaker at these events is I don't want to do live ones. I travel a lot. Time zones are always changing. It's stressful being live, but doing a pre-recorded session, great. That's what got me to respond, addressing that one key objection that I have. And other people that they're reaching out to probably have other uh, objections, like maybe they, they feel like they're not going to get paid. So let's talk about the commissions there. Now, getting immediate response. How do we do that? Uh, that's one of the big challenges. And uh, one of the easiest ways is just to not expect immediate response and send three letters instead of one. But uh, let's not, let's aim to try to get a response right away. So we talked about limited availability. We talk about premiums. So for example, free locking storage cabinet when you order a certain amount in the next 15 days, you give deadlines, dis give discounts for fast response and penalties for slow response. So for example, enroll by January 15th for $149. Enroll January 15th to February 20th for $200 and then at the door we pay $229. So it's creating this sense of urgency, like you better buy now if you're going to buy at all. And five, make it easy to respond. So you can go to the website, you can call the number, you can send the email, you can just buy right now with your credit card, give people options. All right, here's some effective copy from a sales letter. Dear Mr. Doe, I am writing just a fraction of my previous guests for this first time offer. This is a test that may never be repeated again. Six day, five night, Hawaiian vacation. I've entered into a contract with Holiday Travel of America, one of the nation's largest fully bonded wholesale travel agencies, and I've paid in advance for over 1,000 Hawaiian vacation packages to present as gifts to my return previous guests. When you again accept your fabulous Vegas world invitation with us, we will immediately send you your documents for a wonderful Hawaiian vacation for two. Now, this is the first part of the letter. Now we're going to move on to a very important part. But please remember, this is a test and is being offered to only a fraction of our previous guests and may never be offered again. This offer is available for only until Thursday, November 1st, or until our allotted number of Hawaiian vacations is gone, whichever comes first. So I urge you to act quickly. See so the urgency that's created here. It's only available until this deadline. This is exclusive to you. Uh, we may run out. You better respond now. 
Now, one of the things that I really don't want marketers to do though is to lie. A lot of them will lie and they'll say there's only five in stock. There's actually a hundred in stock. Don't do that. Uh, but you can create urgency by creating a real scarcity. All right, sales letter or checklist. Understand your customer. Write to what is most important to the reader. List every feature. Uh, now, a lot of people might challenge me on this. Uh, and I agree, when you're talking about positioning and strategy, it's not just about listing every feature, particularly with professional services. You, you wanna focus on the main thing that makes you different. Uh, but when you're talking to people that are ready to buy, they're gonna be analyzing and scrutinizing and objecting to every little thing. So uh, lots of details are gonna be helpful, even if they're not uh, necessarily the first things that are gonna show up in the letter. List the benefits. Identify the hidden benefits, identify disadvantages and flaws and address them, list objections slash reasons not to respond and address those, figure out how to get uh, your letter through gatekeepers. So for example, uh, one effective approach that we've used is a big box. Big boxes are more likely to get to the actual recipient. Consider different envelopes. So a, a plain envelope with uh, plastic uh, transparency, more likely to get thrown out than something that's very colorful. Does it command attention and generate interest immediately so it won't get thrown out into the trash bin right next to the mail? Did you craft an amazing headline and subheadline? Did you make your product seem like a good deal? For example, by minimizing the price, by showing uh, the real value and cost that went into developing the product. Did you create urgency? Did you appeal to the buyer's ego? Did you tell an interesting story? Did you repeat important things over and over? Did you keep the reader moving with momentum or was it just a boring academic essay? Is the letter easily skimmable? Is the copy personal and conversational? Did you add a PS? The PS is one of the most well-read aspects of a sales letter. You wanna use underlining, you wanna use bold, italics, highlights, margin notes, visual aids, borders, capitals, captions, coloring, drop caps, indenting, line justification, handwritten like notes in the size of your letter and use text boxes. I remember when I was a kid, I needed to raise money to go to nerd camp and uh, because it was a pretty expensive thing and I got to admit it to this program. One thing that I did was I had a, a um, text written by a laptop letter and then I handwritten notes on the side. I actually handwritten. it. Now you can use simulated handwritten notes, but uh, the letters were very effective. I was, I was very happy with the, uh, the good Samaritan responses that I got from people to help me fund this trip. Uh, you can include a benefits list, the CTA, a phone number, and a website. And these are things that really you, you want to make pop with bold letters, with highlighting, et cetera. You don't want to just bold everything. You want to bold the most important information. And in your copy, you want to be exciting. You want to be passionate and maybe a little bit wild. I think marketers are a little too conservative and tilt on the side of conservative, boring writing. Now, let's conclude here with just a good example of copywriting. Florida vacation homeowners, five big mistakes to avoid when selecting a property management company. Now, this this piece of content isn't what a lot of comp, uh, content marketers are gonna come up with. Why? Because not everybody's gonna wanna read this. It's not gonna be super popular. It's not gonna get a lot of likes. But the important thing here is this is the kind of content the kind of information that is going to appeal to an actual buyer and that is going to persuade them to buy from you. So when we're dealing with direct marketing, when we're dealing with sales letters, we're interested in the people that could be buyers in the near future. And they're going to want to know how to select a property management company, even if 95% of the people in the market don't care about it.